Hey, thanks for helping me get this ready. My kids love Easter. <laughs> Who doesn't love Easter, am I right? Yeah, that's true. But if you think about it, leading up to that first Easter, Jesus had it pretty rough. Wow, never really thought of that. <laughs> I wonder whatever happened to that guy. Well, you know, he, he died on the cross. You sure about that? Yeah. No, no, that's a different guy. I'm thinking of the Jesus that, uh, what's his last name? No, 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 no. It's the same guy. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yep. I just never connected the two together before. Jesus on a cross. I wonder whatever happened to that guy. Um, he, uh, he came back to life. Three days later. What? Yeah. Wait, we're still talking about tomb Jesus. Yeah. That's the same guy? Yeah, yeah, he died on the cross for our sins. No, no, that's a different Jesus. No, 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 same one. Died on the cross, was buried in the tomb, came back to life, and now he sits at the right hand of God. Wait, cross Jesus is the same as right hand of God Jesus? Yeah. Not separate Jesuses? There's no separate Jesus. I just never put them all together before. No, it's still, it's still one guy. Wait, you understand what this means, don't you? One guy did all of that? I mean, that changes history, that changes everything. That is big. He deserves more than just jelly beans for his birthday. Wait, so the Easter Bunny is the no. same? Good morning, church. Good morning. Welcome to worship. Uh, I'm so glad that you're joining us today. My name is James Lee. I'm the pastor of Wesley United Methodist Church. If you hear anything today, know that God loves you, and so do we. As we enter into our Easter Sunday worship service, I'm going to be reading from Scripture I invite you to hear these words from Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, starting from verse 1. After the Sabbath, as the, day, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead. And indeed, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So the women left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to just put your hands like this on your laps. As we enter into worship today, will you join me in prayer? Holy and merciful God, it's been quite a week. Last Sunday, you entered into the city of Jerusalem, hailed as a king, people crying out, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. 
But by Monday, the Jewish leaders, they plotted to have you killed. By Thursday, you had a Passover meal with your disciples, your best friends. One of them would betray you, that you would be arrested and taken away. Another one of your best friends denying you three times. You were tried. And then you were executed on a Roman cross. You were buried in a tomb with your friends assuming that you were dead and dead for good. But today, as the sun is rising, so we too see the sun rising from the grave. Lord, our hearts too are filled with anxiousness and uncertainty, but we feel the great joy rising with the sun. We lean into you today with excitement, with anticipation, with joy. Lead us now in worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Alleluia. Alleluia. Please join me in the call to worship. Out of the darkness of grief and despair comes a message of hope. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. We run to the tomb to see for ourselves, and it is true. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. We hear a voice call our name, and we know our risen Lord is with us now and always. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen indeed. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. You want to clap your hands. Praise the Lord, everybody. Christ has risen on today. Christ has risen on today. And we lift him up with our praises. The Bible declares that he is enthroned by the praise of his people.
Join me in the unison prayer. With great joy, we welcome you, Lord Jesus. The journey has been long, and we have longed to enter the holy city. You come into our hearts and our lives, humbly, patiently, encouraging us to learn and grow, to embark on journeys of hope and healing. Open our hearts today to hear your words as we sing praise to you. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen.
third day. Once again, welcome to Wesley United Methodist Church. I'm so glad that you're joining us for worship today. I'll say it one more time. If you hear anything today, know that God loves you and so do we. Uh, if you are new here, I want to invite you to fill out the I'm New Here card. They're the blue cards that look like this in your pews. Just put your name and one way to contact you. Just drop it in the offering plate and we would love to reach out to you for you to get to know us, for us to get to know you as well. Also, if you haven't done so already, now's a great time to fill out those uh, red fellowship pads. Uh, they look just like this. In each of the pews, just write your name and pass it down, and this is a great way for us to remain connected as a church family. Uh, go ahead and do that at this time. Thank you so much. So I have a few announcements uh, to share this morning. So when I think about our faith and what is the greatest purpose in our lives, it is to know God uh, to know his love for us, and then to grow together in our faith, and then to go out and serve the world, to make the world a better place uh, for God. So it's to know God, to grow together, and serve the world. And we do this in many different kinds of ways. Uh, there are two ways that we are doing this right now, and it's, you can find in our announcement bulletin. Uh, this Tuesday, April 19th, uh, we are having a blood drive, uh, and uh, it's from 1 p.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, you can contact Genevieve. Her information is there to schedule an appointment this Tuesday. Uh, one thing that's really exciting about uh, donating blood, I believe, is that uh, when you give a pint of blood, you can save up to three lives. And I think there's nothing more Christian than actually giving of our blood to give someone life. Amen? Amen. Christ shed his blood for us that we may be forgiven, have new life, and have life to the full. And when we do something like this, we're actually doing this uh, following in Christ's footsteps, giving of our blood just a little bit so that someone might live. Also, if you sign up uh, for this blood drive in April, uh, New Jersey Blood Services is going to be donating $1 to Global Blood uh, Fund's Ukrainian support efforts. So when you give uh, a, a pint of blood, when you give blood, you can also help our sisters and brothers impacted by the war in the Ukraine. I hope many of you can participate in that. Next, uh, our mission team of our church uh, decided that we're going to be making uh, exam survival kits for our college students. Uh, that's for our students uh, that are connected to our church family and also for uh, the students at the Rutgers Campus Ministry. So these exam survival kits are going to include like snacks and coffee and uh, I'm looking at uh, what else? Balls, Stress balls. Trips to Europe. I don't know about that. <laughs> Trips to Europe. But some of you, even though, how, whatever age you are, if you've been to college, you remember those college days and finals and exams and late nights studying. Y'all know that. Some of you are going through it right now. Well, finals is just around the corner, and we want to remind our college students that they are loved, that God loves them more than they can imagine. So this is one way that we're going to do that. Uh, we're going to be uh, packing those exam survival kits on May 1st. Uh, we are uh, accepting monetary donations so that we can buy those supplies and make sure all those kits have uh, what is needed the most. So please, I hope that many of you can participate in that and donate to the exam survival kits uh, by May the 1st. Uh, after service today, there is no fellowship hour, uh, but don't go anywhere. After the service is over, we're going to go right out the front doors and take a group picture. Tom, can you just wave your hand real quick? Tom Stillman is back to take a group picture. Amen. Amen. We thank you, Tom. Yeah, we give Tom a round of applause. Yes. So uh, after service, once again, don't go anywhere. We're going to go right out the front doors. We're going to take one big group picture. Uh, thanks to Tom. All right. All right. Any other announcements we made this morning? All right. If not, I'm going to invite uh, our friend Corbin to come forward for a moment here. Corbin is our video production specialist. Uh, come on up, Corbin. Hey, <laughs> so uh, for those of you who don't know, Corbin has been our video production specialist since September of 2020. If all of you remember, March of 2020 was the pandemic, the lockdown, 
and we started producing online services uh, so we could all worship together. And uh, that kind of fell on my shoulders. I was shooting and editing and editing late into the night. And, uh, and <laughs> I, I, was, I would be really stressed when it wouldn't go up when it's supposed to. It was, a, it was a, quite, a, quite a ride, quite a season. Well, uh, during that time, Corbin, a good friend of mine and a, a fantastic video producer, uh, came on board with us. And he took on... Uh, shooting and uh, producing the online services took it to a whole nother level far beyond what I could have ever done and uh, Now that so when we transitioned back in person uh, Corbin uh, took care of and led the live stream setup. He worked with John and uh, our, our wonderful uh, Tech leader John Biggs and he trained our volunteers and we have the live stream that is up and running uh, We're so thankful and uh, Today is Corbin's last day with us officially on staff because uh, uh, Corbin, uh, as you know, he had a new baby, two. number two Canon, and uh, there are a lot of great opportunities that are coming his way, and uh, we decided that it would be right to officially close this chapter in Corbin's life, although he said he'll still be around. Still be uh, <laughs> uh, some of the things that, uh, some of the memories that come to mind are, um, you know, during the times when we would record the online services on Wednesday, Wednesdays, he would drive back, and he would pick up... Uh, Popeye's chicken sandwiches, and we would talk about how delicious Popeye chicken sandwiches were. Uh, some of you would remember Corbin, uh, his wonderful singing voice. He sang on Christmas. How many of you remember his beautiful singing voice uh, leading us in worship? Yes, yeah, right. S some, uh, some of you also on the trustees remember Corbin would fly drones to take pictures of the roof for y'all, right? <laughs> he was just, he'll go above and beyond to serve the church and to just uh, bring us so much joy. And even along the way, I, I saw Corbin test, testifying to and witnessing his faith to uh, the people that he encountered. And it was so encouraging to see Corbin and his leadership. We're going to miss you. We love you. And uh, I'm actually going to give Corbin now an opportunity to just say a few words uh, at this time. No, they gave me a microphone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so if I haven't met you individually, hi, I'm Corbin. Also, bye, I'm Corbin. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, James is a, a dear friend, and I've come to know a lot of you guys in this community and congregation. Uh, I just want to say thank you for supporting me, uh, so for supporting our digital ministry, um, as we had to you know, flex during COVID and kind of shift the way that we do some things. Uh, and thank you for hanging on and transitioning back with us. Um, so I just want to say thank you for the support that you guys as a congregation has, have offered me for the opportunity to serve uh, you and also alongside of you in your various mission uh, capabilities and fields. Uh, it's been a blessing for both me and my family, and I thank you for the opportunity and the blessing that it has been to be on this journey with you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Don Palmer, and as chair of the Staff Parish Relations Committee, I, I get this opportunity to embarrass myself once more. Um, <laughs> Corbin was very great when you had to tape it in front of him. He always made you feel like you were doing a good job. So, so that we're appreciative. And so uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is to help you because you're still going to be traveling. We try to get... Uh, Popeye's no longer has gift cards, as I found out late yesterday. So, <laughs> so uh, but you'll, you'll have something there. And thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Okay. Okay. Can we all just extend out our right hand as a sign of blessing as we pray for Corbin? Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity that we had to work with Corbin uh, during these last uh, couple months, this year and a half. Lord, we're so thankful for new life, for, uh, for Canon, uh, Corbin and McCann's new son. And Lord, we're thankful for the new opportunities that are coming Corbin's way. Lord, we are sad to see him go, but we are excited for what you are about to do in his life. So may you bless him, anoint him with your oil of grace, that wherever he goes, he may share your, your love your power and your might. Uh, may the resurrection power of the empty tomb go forth with him, Lord, that in all that he does, it will be for your glory. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's give another uh, round of applause to thank Corbin. Thank you, Corbin.
Once again, I would like to thank all of you for supporting us through the pandemic. You know, this was a very difficult time. And I'm so glad that this Easter we're able to come back together. Uh, and especially those of you who gave regularly uh, to the church during this time, even though maybe you weren't here in person, I want to thank you. Thank you for your generosity, your gifts. Because of your faithfulness, we were able to be God's uh, hands and feet to our hurting community and our world. Uh, those of you who are ready to give, you can give in three ways. You can give via envelope using the offering plates in the back or in the front. Uh, those of you joining us online, you could uh, mail a check to Wesley United Methodist Church at 1500 Plainfield Avenue, South Plainfield, New Jersey. That's 07080. You could also give online at wumcsp.org slash give. You could also use the Tithely app. That's a giving app where you could set up recurring payments um, and keep track of all of your giving records as well. So we hope that you participate in that. And once again, thank you. Thank you for your gifts. Will you please join me now in the offering prayer found in your bulletins and on the screen. Let's pray together. You are the great provider and the giver of life. Thank you for putting time, treasures, and talents into our hands. And so we freely offer it back to you for use in your mission in the world. We do this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture reading this morning is from the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verses 12 to 21. You can find it in your pew Bible on page 185. I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers and sisters, having been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, 
dare to speak the word with greater boldness and without fear. Some proclaim Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. Others proclaim, pro proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering in my imprisonment. What does it matter? Just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true, and, that, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in any way, but that by speaking with all boldness, Christ will be exalted now as always in my body, whether life or by death. For to me, living in Christ, living is Christ and dying is gain. The word of God for the people of God. Will you join me in prayer? Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for our gathering today. We thank you for celebrating life in so many ways. Now we come to you seeking a word as we reflect on the resurrection. I am an unworthy vessel, but your word is true, so may you speak. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So today we're actually starting a new sermon series on the book of Philippians titled Joy. Uh, this letter was written by the Apostle Paul about 20 years after the uh, Easter event. And uh, you may be asking, uh, Pastor, why are you turning to Philippians on Easter Sunday? <laughs> well, if I were to, again, characterize the letter, of the, uh, uh, the letter written to the Philippians using one word, I would call this letter the letter of joy. A letter of joy. Uh, this is a letter that Paul wrote in prison. We don't know if this is one of his earlier imprisonments or what, if this is, in fact, his last one before his death. He died for his faith, for, for uh, believing in what he believed. But in this letter, we learn what a powerful, joy-filled life looks like. A joy that is never-ending, a joy that is deep and fulfilling and electrifying. A joy that can only be achieved from faith rooted in the resurrection. Some of you today are longing for this joy. Some of you today are hungry for this kind of joy. You're asking, you know, Pastor, how do I get this joy? I'm longing, I, I need this in my life right now. Well, I invite you to lean in and hear this story of a man who wa once walked the earth, who died and was raised to life. Now, some of you, when you hear that, are like, what now? Right? <laughs> Someone died and came back to life? Like, what, what are you, is this like a, like a zombie or a horror movie? What is this, right? Someone died, actually died, and then came back to life? Really, pastor? Now, others of you, maybe you've been to church, you've grown up, grown up in church, you've heard it all the time. Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. And you heard it so many times that it just goes in one ear and out the other. But today, I want to invite you to just pause for a moment and to reflect on this sentence, right? Jesus walked the earth. He died, and he came back to life. Is it just, now, now, now is this just some sort of metaphorical or symbolic, oh yeah, you know, he died, but he, he lives on in our hearts. His, his teachings live on forever. Is, are we talking about a metaphorical eternal life, or is this in fact an actual resurrection, is the claim that, in fact, a man walked the earth, died, and was in the tomb for three days, and then rose again, true? I say that most Americans don't disagree 
with the historic Jesus, a man named Yeshua who lived in Nazareth some 2,000 years ago. Historians all agree that this man actually existed, but did he die and actually come back to life? Did he, in fact, rise from the dead? We say it all the time, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Do you believe it? Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, doesn't just offer you something that is uh, vague or immaterial or ethereal or some sort of afterlife idea. It actually offers you a new body. In a renewed, perfect world, we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's this faith that actually the kingdom of God is coming here and now, an actual reality here, specifically in the gospel reading from Matthew from the beginning of service and from Paul's experiences uh, written in this letter, we learn that the resurrection of Jesus Christ offers us two things, something that is profoundly rational and something that is profoundly transformational, something that is profoundly rational and something that is profoundly transformational, meaning if you don't believe today, then we need to look into it. If you're not sure today, then you need to lean into it and see what this is all about. In layman's terms, right, we're going to be talking about why you can and should believe in the resurrection, and number two, why it matters for us today. So let's unpack these. Number one, firstly, we can believe in the resurrection because the resurrection of Jesus Christ is in fact, is actually, if you look into it, profoundly rational. You know, so very often, the stereotype for Christians is that, you know, Christians just believe in weird stuff, right? They're unscientific, people say, right? They don't use the scientific method. They just blindly believe whatever they read in the Bible, or perhaps more accurately, they b blindly believe whatever they heard spoken about what is written in the Bible, right? Them Christians over there are irrational, is the stereotype. Believing in the bodily resurrection of someone. But if you read the text with a critical eye, you'll find that this is actually more and more plausible. It becomes a, an actual rational uh, belief in honesty, uh, uh, something that you can believe honestly. So let's dive in in Matthew chapter 28. So here, it's Sunday morning. It, uh, it tells us, Scripture tells us it was still dark outside. And Mary Magdalene and another Mary, they go to the tomb, and they're bringing spices because... Uh, Jesus is dead. It's his dead body. How do we keep a dead, dead body from rotting? Spices. So they're here to care for the body. He's dead. He's dead, dead. Another thing I thought was really fascinating is that there isn't a crowd waiting outside this tomb. You know, Jesus said that he was going to rise again. You would think a few people might have believed him and would have been, I, I thought, you know, a crowd should be outside waiting for him and counting down, right? He said he's going to come back to life, so maybe he will. Three, two, one. Nothing. No, there was no crowd. No one believed that this man who died on a cross would actually come back to life. Why? Because it's unreasonable. It just doesn't happen. Sometimes we think back then people were a little more, they believed in weird stuff. No, they were, they were rational, skeptical human beings. They too know that if you die, you die. You, people tend to stay dead, and so they stayed home. They didn't get up that first Sunday, Easter morning. Scientifically, people who die stay dead. I always found it fascinating how if someone were to be making this up, right there, imagine someone is trying to create a story a mythos to try and convince a large crowd to believe in this new movement, this new religion that they're apparently starting, they wouldn't record something that would compromise the, the, the authority of the new leaders. So here, imagine the church is starting and people are writing about what happened with Jesus. The new leaders are like Peter and, and James and John, right? But all through the Gospels, you hear these stories of how they've been silly, They've just not understood Jesus at all. They were skeptical. I mean, Peter is depicted as denying Jesus three times. Why would someone write something that compromises the authority of the leaders that you are trying to lift up, right? If this is a made-up story, trying to prop up this new movement, then you wouldn't write something that would compromise the authority of the leaders. Now, 
speaking of things that you would do or not do when you're making this up, let's look at Mary Magdalene. So Mary is the first eyewitness of the empty tomb and the resurrected Christ. There was a second century Greek philosopher by the name of Celsus who did not like Christians. He did not like, he hated Christianity. And he wrote many, many literature on why Christianity is silly, why it's false. And one of his prime arguments, one of his number one arguments was this. Listen to this quote. He said, quote, how can anyone expect rational men to listen to the testimony of a hysterical female? Oh, boy. <laughs> Uh, even, in, uh, even in 1863, a French historian by the name of Ernest Renan argued that Mary Magdalene was, quote, the hallucinating witness whose love made her imagine that Jesus was personally risen and whose testimony somehow convinced the other five disciples, end quote. Right? In their respective times, right, back in the 1800s and back in the second century, this argument was valid. It was these, especially in the second, in the first and second centuries, during that time, a woman's testimony was not valid in the court of law, right? It was not good enough to be proof of evidence of that something happened. That's how lowly society has seen women for so long. Now, listen carefully. Again, if they were making this up in the first century, they would not have said that their first, first witness was a woman because that would compromise and almost, in, 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 in some circles, invalidate their, their cause. The only reason why they would have said that a woman was the first preacher of the gospel, a woman was the first witness to the risen Christ, is if that's just the way it actually happened. If they were making this up, this isn't what they would write. Here, you know, ironically, back then, this was proof why Christianity was unbelievable. But today, in 2022, this is, in fact, actually showing why this is a plausible, plausible, believable account. Because they wouldn't have written it this way if they were making it up. The only, only, thing we can, uh, only conclusion we can come to is that that's just the way it actually happened that a woman was, a Mary Magdalene, was the first preacher of the gospel, the first witness of the resurrected Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, uh, about that, that letter was about 15 or 20 years after the resurrection event, uh, and he writes there that hundreds of people have seen Christ after he rose from the dead, after his crucifixion. He said at one time there was an event when 500 people had gathered together and saw him and witnessed him, and they got to touch him and talk to him. And this was, again, only 15 years or 20 years after the resurrection. So Paul was saying, if you're not sure, go talk to these people. They're there. They can tell you what happened. The gospel authors and the authors of the New Testament were inviting constantly the early Christians, the early potential Christians, to use their brains, to use their God-given reasoning, to analyze the evidence, and to see, in fact, if Christ has risen, right? Don't fall into your previous understandings of science like those disciples who stayed at home did. Open your mind. Review the evidence and see if truly Christ is indeed risen because you'd find that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is surpri surprisingly rational. And, and do you know what is, uh, in fact, at least for me, the most solidifying evidence of that there was a cataclysmic event like the resurrection that happened during this time. How do you explain the complete, radical, 180 shift for all the disciples if Jesus didn't rise from the dead? How do you explain why seven weeks later, these illiterate fishermen will preach the gospel in Jerusalem to the same people who cried out for Jesus' crucifixion and how 3,000 of those people will be baptized and enter into the life as followers of Christ, right? If, if, the, if the Jewish leaders had taken Jesus' body, if the Romans had, for some reason, taken Jesus' body, and that's why the tomb was empty, all they had to do was just present the body. That's all they had to do. 
in order to put an end to this silly movement. If the disciples somehow went seal team six and went around the guards and somehow got the body of Jesus, that still doesn't explain why these followers of Jesus who were terrified and locked in their rooms, knowing that they would die, they could be arrested and killed at any moment, would suddenly shift and risk their lives to go and share that Jesus is risen. Why all the disciples would be martyred in some way, except John, who would die uh, alone in an island, right? All of them would give their lives for this cause. Why the sudden shift? Why the sudden shift? Why would they give up their lives and be martyred to a supposedly deceitful cause? Japanese novelist Shusako Endo concluded this way, quote, If you don't believe in the resurrection, you'll be forced to believe that something hit the disciples that was every bit as amazing, maybe different, yet of equal force in its electrifying intensity. For if we try to explain the changed lives of the early Christians, you will find yourself making leaps of faith as great as if you had believed in the resurrection to start with. You follow. You see, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not just rational. It's profoundly transformational. It changes lives, right? And and in fact, the changed lives is perhaps the largest evidence of the believability of the resurrected Christ. You know, Paul, who wrote the letter to the Philippians, uh, never met Jesus face to face while he walked the earth, while he was still alive um, uh, the first time around. And uh, in fact, the first time we see Paul, he is a Pharisee, a zealous Pharisee. He, he studied the Jewish law under the greatest rabbis at the time, and he hated the Christians. They were making us Jews look bad to the Romans and to everyone else. And so what did he do? Most of his time, he would go and capture, arrest, and even kill the Christians. That was pretty much becoming his full-time job going from place to place and capturing these Christ followers. Now, he was on his way to Damascus, as many of you have heard this story, and on his way, a shining light intercepts him, and he is blinded, right? And there, he is face to face with Jesus the Christ. And Jesus calls him by his Jewish name, Saul, and he says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And from that moment on, his life shifts 180. His life is transformed. The the Christian hater becomes the number one missionary of the Christian faith, sharing it through all the world, all the land, going constantly traveling and ultimately giving his life so that more and more people will know that Jesus Christ is Lord and that the risen Savior is, is here and now, right? This man went through this life changing transformation. And so some 20 years after that life-transforming encounter with Jesus, now Paul is in Roman chains around his ankle, uh, around his wrist and on his neck. He has a big wooden brace around his ankles. He is in a filthy, unsanitary jail. And here, he can't write a letter because he's in chains, so he recites a letter for his assistant who is visiting him to write a letter for him to be sent to the church in Philippi. And what does Paul say in the letter? He writes about having what? Joy. Joy. He writes that he has joy even in prison because, he says, most of the brothers and sisters, having been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, they are to speak the word with greater boldness and without fear. He's saying somehow me being in prison is allowing some of the other Christians preach the gospel with more Confidence, even more boldly, without fear. Amen. He has joy. You know, there's some, in the text, some uh, confusion about, you know, some maybe different people are preaching the gospel for different reasons or different motives. Maybe it's not always the purest of motives. But he says in verse 18, what does he say? Let's read this together. What does it matter? Just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. 
despite being imprisoned in this unsanitary prison, uh, impending potential shameful death, Paul has joy. He says, I rejoice. He says, Christ in me is to live, to die is to gain. How can he say this? Unless the resurrection of Jesus is rational and therefore inevitably transformational. Okay, so you might say, Pastor, that sounds great. Maybe, you've conv- maybe I've convinced you that Jesus, in fact, rose from the dead. But uh, maybe it made a difference back in the first century. Maybe it made a difference for Paul in like 50, 60 AD. Uh, but how does proving that someone once lived and died and came back to life 2,000 years ago matter to me now today? Well, listen to this. World-renowned uh, neurologist and psychologist Uh, Victor Frankl, he wrote this wonderful book uh, called Man's Search for Meaning, and he said in there, quote, joy cannot be pursued. It must ensue, and it only does so as the unintended side effect of one's personal surrender to a person other than oneself. What what is this talking about? So social psychologists uh, agree on what's called the pleasure paradox. We talked about this before, right? The pleasure paradox is this. Uh, If you seek after things that you think will make you happy, and give you pleasure, like if you chase after uh, money, if you chase after sex, if you chase after success, all these things you think will make you happy, the more you go after it, the more you will not be happy. The pleasure paradox. The more you chase after it, the less you actually gain it. That is happiness. That is joy. How do you gain joy? Viktor Frankl is saying it is an unintended side effect of one surrendering to another person other than oneself an unconditional love relationship with another. Many of you know this. Joy that comes from that unconditional relationship, right? The greatest joy that I felt in my life has been when I got married to my wife. One of the greatest joys in my life I've experienced was when I first met my child and I became a dad. Right? So much joy that comes there. We chase after money and all these things. No, it's, it's in that unconditional loving relationship that we find joy. But as we are reminded terribly every day, relationships come to an end. Our lives are finite. And if our joy is based on our relationship with another person, whether that's our child or our parents or our spouse, inevitably, that means that that joy is also finite. If Viktor Frankl is right, then we are all doomed for heartache and heartbreak and loss of joy. That is unless the only possible hope is unless there is a person to whom we can surrender that will never die. Do you follow? that this is precisely the only way we can possibly have lasting joy. And that joy is available to us, sisters and brothers, because the Son of God lived the life we should have lived. He died the death we should have died, and He rose again from the dead to live forever, seated at the right hand of God the Father. This joy is possible. When the two Marys See the empty tomb. Verse 8 tells us this. Let's read this together. They left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. It's as if we're seeing the transformation here in real time. It's like two cars passing by in the night. There's fear and there's joy. I mean, how many times does fear and joy coexist? Not often, right? But here, right, they were full of fear because their Lord has died. They don't know what their future is going to hold. But you're seeing the fear drop and the great joy rise again. It's that very moment of transformation where joy and fear are switching levels. There's a sudden rise of joy. If in the beginning of the passage there's fear up here and joy down here, you're seeing that change. But on the way to see the disciples, something remarkable happens, right? Verse 9 says, Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. 
You know, something that has caught my mind often when I read this is that Jesus didn't have to show himself to the women, right? The angel had already told them that Jesus was going to meet them in Galilee. So why did Jesus take a moment to actually meet the women on the way to Galilee, to, to, in, to be, meet them and to show himself to them? He could have just gone straight to Galilee. Why did Jesus do that? The only reason I could come up with was that he loved them. He wanted to celebrate in this exciting new joy that they were embarking in. He simply loved them and wanted to see them again. That's the only explanation I could think of. And here, the word for greetings is actually the Greek Cairo, which isn't just, hey there, or hello, right? Actually, this word is better translated rejoice. Rejoice, have joy. Yes, you do not have to be afraid anymore. You do not have to be afraid that the joy that you have in your life is fleeting or might die someday. No. Joy eternal is available now through me. Rejoice. Have joy. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, or another translation may be, whoever surrenders to him, surrenders to this person in an unconditional loving relationship will never die but have eternal life, will have eternal joy, will have eternal hope. If you truly encounter the resurrected Christ, your life will transform, much like the women in the tomb and the, the illiterate fishermen and Paul. The trajectory of your life will change forever. Eternal joy can only come when we are in a relationship with and surrender to an eternal person. And that person is here. His name is Jesus. Imagine a church filled with deeply passionate followers of Christ who love and know Christ to the point where we too can say, Christ in me is to live. To die is actually to gain. Where they no longer fear even death itself because we live here and now in Christ. You know, I've heard it said uh, for a Christian, death is not extinguishing the light. It is putting out the lamp because the dawn has come. Imagine a church filled with people who know Christ like Paul did. A church without fear. A church that is bold. A church filled with never-ending joy. It will transform the world. Beloved, may we be that church tethered to the rational and transformational resurrection of Christ. You can believe it. Church, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Holy and living God, we come here this Easter Sunday, some of us having a rough week like Jesus did. Some of us mourning losses of loved ones like Jesus did. Some of us going through some really difficult times that is hard to describe. Lord Jesus, we are hungry for joy. Thank you, God, that you didn't just stay in the sky. You actually came down to be with us, that we may have a tangible, eternal, loving relationship, a person to whom, to whom we can surrender ourselves and impart experience eternal joy. Fill us with that joy, Lord. Fill this church with that joy, Lord. Lord, that we too can cry out, Alleluia, for Christ is risen today. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you now to please rise and join us in singing our closing hymn, Christ the Lord is risen today.
now receive the blessing. Go forth, children of the Most High God, recipients of the greatest love this world has ever known. Going forth, knowing that the eternal joy is available to you through the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Go forth and share that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Share that great news with our neighbors and with the world. In the name of the one who is our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. Amen and amen. amen. God bless you. Hey, how's it going? Happy Easter. Glad you came. Happy Easter. <laughs> huh? I don't know. Hey, good morning, good morning. Good, good. Happy Easter, Maria. Hey, happy Easter, Ryan. Good. 